We're in Revelation chapter 6 today. We're going to pick up where we left off last Sunday. Revelation chapter 6. And if you have been here and forgotten, that's fine. If I asked you what you eat three weeks ago on Sunday morning, you probably won't remember either. But we know that as uh, food gives us nourishment to our physical bodies, hearing from the word gives us strength to our spiritual bodies. But if you're at home or haven't been watching or uh, updated, uh, chapter 1 is kind of the introduction that we went through a few weeks ago. Uh, then we went through uh, chapters 1 through 3 are kind of things of the earth. We said the Revelation was divided into three sections, things that were, things that are, and things that will be. And the things that were was chapter 1, the churches that were there in per, uh, uh, the church at Laodicea and Pergamum and the seven churches, those things that were are, those were real churches in a real place with real problems. Anyone go to a church with real problems? I know I do. <laughs> if there's people, there's problems. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. By the blood of Jesus, by the love of Christ, we can work right past those problems. You heard me say several times, sometimes on Wednesday afternoons, I'd come in here with the lights off. I did this last Wednesday. I got down here on the altar with all the lights off, and I'm praying, and I argue with myself sometimes, and I'm like, I'm the only one in the building, and I found someone to argue with. <laughs> So you can imagine when you bring two or three people. Uh, we do value God's Word very highly. If you don't have a copy of God's Word handy with you, I see Chris back here. If you want to sh slip your hand up, Chris will get you a Bible. And as usual, if you don't have a copy of God's Word, a good study Bible you'd like to take home, please let us know. I can't tell you what a privilege it would be Copy your very own copy of God's Word. But uh, w without the rule book, you can't win the game. And folks, Satan is hot after you. He's hot after your children. He's, he's in a war for our, your grandchildren. D -d 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 this far and no farther, Satan. Thus saith the Lord. You have to push back. We're going to look today in uh, Revelation 6. Uh, then we saw in Revelation 4, the throne room. Oh my goodness, what a glorious day. Who's ready for that day? When we see that rainbow circling the throne and the four living creatures and the 24 elders praising God, hallelujah, praise the lamb, praise the lamb that was slain. I'm ready. I'm ready right now. I am so ready. Who's ready? Hallelujah. You want to wait? Rachel, you want to wait till the 24th or are you ready? <laughs> She's due on the 24th. <laughs> I'm ready right now. <laughs> But in any event, so that we've been going through these churches and we've talked about the church age and that some, some uh, theologians think those are church ages. We don't get too caught up in that. Could be. We know there are real churches with real problems. We get to the throne room. And now we're in the throne room. And uh, it said that uh, John the Revelator weeped because he said there was no one that was worthy to open the scroll. And the scroll, we said, would have been something rolled up with some seals on it. And it was the complete, full will of God. We saw that scroll when we studied that section back in Daniel, where the angel told the Daniel to seal up the scroll and don't show it. It's, pro it's possibly, possibly that same scroll that was sealed up, and now it's being opened, and we're seeing God's full revealed will. And when it says, who's, who's able to open the seals? And it says, no one was found in heaven or on earth or below the earth. No one was worthy. And then the, one of the living beasts said, but there is one. The lamb that was uh, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And I can picture John saying, the lion of Judah. And he looks back and he sees this little lamb standing as though it was slain. Jesus came to this earth the first time as the lamb. He's coming back as the lion. Amen. Are you ready? Come on, man. You at home, are you ready? Because what we look at today is when that day comes, yeah. what happens? Go. There's going to be two groups here. This today is probably one of the most significant messages that an unsafe person can hear. I am praying. I sat back there when we were singing. I got down on my hands and knees on that chair, and I prayed, God, call one into your family today. It won't be my words. It'll be the Holy Spirit that draws that person. Bind the, the demons up that's controlling that. I want you to know if you're here at home, if you're a homosexual, if you're an alcoholic, if you're a drug addict, if you're into prostitution, I don't care what your sin is, we love you. We love you. Jesus loves you. Jesus, friend of sinner. I'm going to have to review those words. There's one little section there. I don't know if anyone else caught it. I peek my little red flag up. It says, when my sin goes to a place where grace cannot go, there is no place in your sin that grace cannot go to. 
So when I saw that, is that what the word says? Those that sang that song, I read it. I was like, did I read that wrong? I just want to be clear. Maybe I read it wrong. There is no sin you can do that grace cannot go but one. The rejection of Jesus Christ. You reject the Holy Spirit. You reject God's forgiveness. We're going to look today at what's going to happen. I, 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 could, I can pray. I can plead. I can beg you to come to the Lord, but you have to come by yourself. God pleads. It is the will of God that no one should perish. And we say, well, God, prove it. Okay, here's my son, the lamb that was slain from the foundations of the world. What more can he give? There's nothing else he can do. So we see, uh, then we saw, so last week we picked up the first part of chapter 6, which was uh, the first four seals. And the first four seals, we said number one was uh, the, the horse that came in on the white horse. And we talked about that. Some people might think it's the Christ. Really, I think it's the Antichrist. We looked at Revelation 19, and when John sees Christ, the, the, the description he gives is radically different than this description. So although the white horse, I think it is, could be the Antichrist and will fool some, may even fool some of the elect. We could be tricked. Is Satan smarter than us? He's smarter than me. I, I get, when he comes to me, you know what I got to do? I got to go to the Word. I got to go to the Word and say, oh, oh Satan, hold, it, hold a second here. Ah, right here. It is written. <laughs> what about this? What a, don't you want to do this, Brother Dale? Oh, 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 let me look at that. Oh, 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 whoa, oh, oh, whoa, oh, 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 oh. whoa. Satan, it is written. It's written. Your lies don't hold up against this. Well, what about this? Oh, hold right over here, Satan. It is written. You know, probably after the third or fourth time, he'll probably leave you alone. So well, I lost that battle. I cannot tell you how much I want to thump him in the head with it is written every chance I get. The devil is a liar. And his lies cause real human suffering. Real tragedy. Real heartbreak. Who does he think he is? How, I feel like David says, Satan, how dare you, you throw an accusation, accusation against the soldiers, the, uh, the family of the living God. Yeah. Boy, that David, he, had a, he was on fire, wasn't he? Yes, Goliath was running his mouth. <laughs> David said, who, who is this dog that would dare open his mouth? Yeah. You're going to start treating Satan like that. Satan, you know who I am in Christ? You don't speak to me that way. I'll, I'll stick my big brother on you. I'll pull out the written word. And one day, we're going to get in Revelation 6 today, you'll be dealing with the incarnate word. And I'm looking forward to that day, devil, when Jesus comes back with all the heavenly host and the flaming swords. And he's looking for you. <laughs> and you'll get your just desserts. Now, we're looking in Revelation today. And folks, this is the problem, is as much as I love the name, Jesus, friend of sinner, because that's me, as much as I love that name, we also have a God that's just. And he is going to judge your sin at Calvary, or he's going to judge your sin when you show up in his courtroom. And I am so thankful that my sin was judged at Calvary 2,000 years ago. And if you're not a believer... You're going to be judged on your merit. So we looked at the four horsemen. We looked at the Antichrist, and he would bring a false peace. Then we looked at uh, the, the, uh, the next horse that came, the, the red horse, was war. And, and it said war was loosed in the earth. Is there war in the world today? Yes, you know, some people argue, you know, we talked when we did the introduction to Revelation, there's a lot of different uh, beliefs and a lot of different ideas. And if you go to anyone that says, I know all the answers to Revelation, run from them. Because no, they don't. We don't understand every specific thing going on. Some's given to us, and we can see it clearly. We can disagree on some things. Some people believe that the four horsemen's already been loosed. Jesus said there's many antichrists. The spirit of antichrist is in the world today. There, you know, there are some people that say Jesus Christ is not the Son of God. There are people that believe that. That's the spirit of the antichrist. Has war been loosed on our on our world? Is there war on the world? The second horse. The third horse, famine. Has famine been released in the world? Have we seen that? Yeah. These are concepts that if I say, I, I do believe already we see them in the world. Yeah. The day's going to come when it's going to be way worse, though. 
And then the fourth horse, the pale horse, it says, and death and all of Hades followed with him. And we talked about how the fourth beast, we'll pick up there in uh, chapter uh, 6 of verse 7, it says, when the lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard a voice from the fourth, uh, fourth living creature say, come. And I looked, and behold, an ashen or a pale horse, and he who sat on it had the name Death, and Hades was following with him, and authority was given to him over to uh, the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, there's war, and with famine, and with pestilence, and by wild beasts of the earth. And we looked at Ezekiel, where it said, Ezekiel said in the end days that animals would start eating human beings. We see it happen, but as I mentioned last week, if there's a crocodile in Australia that bites somebody, it makes news here. It is bizarre that, the, that animals would attack humans. It happens. We know that. But it's definitely not normal. It's very abnormal. There's going to come a time when this is normal. And then we talked last week. It said about can you, a fourth of the population is going to die. It said you wouldn't be able to bury them quickly enough. Jesus in Matthew 24 said the beasts of the field and the, air, the fowls of heaven, the birds of heaven will come down and eat the corpses. Wow. We won't be able to bury them quickly enough. Folks, this is, and if you're a believer, we said in Bible study today, if you're a believer, we don't have to worry about this. When the Bible says, you know, I think that one of the several sins that are acceptable in churches today is fear. Does God say, do not be afraid? Do not fear. Be anxious for some things. Be anxious for nothing. So when we read this, we don't have to worry. We, we, I think one of the songs today said, let our hearts break for what breaks yours. This is not to scare us. This is to propel us forward with, we, the, the ship is sinking. People are going to die. We've got to get them to the lifeboat of Jesus Christ. Right. This energizes our, our, our missionary and our uh, evangelical goals. This isn't the spirit of fear. Where there is love, fear is cast out. Oh, man. That's good. You know, you love your fellow neighbor, your fellow worker, your your. You kids that are going to school, you love your classmates, you tell them about Jesus. And I hear people, well, I don't want to witness because I'm afraid. Then you don't got perfect love yet. Because where there's perfect love, there is no fear. Love casts out fear. I would, never, I would dread being on a ship, it hits iceberg, and someone say, well, the ship's going down, everyone's going to die, i got a rowboat over here, but man, I'm afraid to tell anybody about it. I don't want to tell somebody, because what if they laugh at me? Who are you worried about? Don't be worried about you. You know what the, the Bible tells us? You know who you should be worried about? Not the one that can take your physical life. What does that mean? Anyone going to die? <laughs> you know how I know sin is universal? The wages of sin is death. Yes. Everyone sins and so everyone dies. But I got good news. You know why the good news is so good? Because the bad news is so bad. And the good news, the good news is, but God loved the world so much he gave his son to die for you. So, so while the wages of sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life through his son, Jesus Christ. That's good news. Praise God. That is good news, Jesus. That is good news. We're, we're going to get to Revelation 6 here in a minute. <laughs> we're almost done with the intro. The fifth seal. Verse 9, Revelation chapter 6. When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. These are our brothers and sisters who when death came knocking at their door, they said, my testimony is solid. I won't turn my back on Jesus Christ. I've got a friend of mine, I'm meeting him with this, this afternoon, I've known him probably 15 years or so, maybe tw something like that, and uh, he, he had served some time in prison, maybe I've told you about him, I, I saw him in, uh, I went to Southwest Baptist Theological Seminary, and I was looking through this magazine, and in the magazine from Southwest Baptist Theological, one of the seminaries of Southern Baptist uh, support, some of our monies that we give in our cooperative program pays for those seminaries, and I, I was reading this article and said, man, this guy served time in TDCJ, six years, and he got his degree, and now he's at Southwest Baptist Theological Seminary, and the guy had his back flared out, and it was covered in jailhouse tats. And, and I said, wow, look at this. Can you imagine? God saves God's friend, yeah. Jesus, friend of sinner. Yeah. And my friend Brandon looked at me, said, rolled his sleeve up, and said, that's me. 
That, that, I'm that person that's going to Southwest that served six years at TDCJ. God saved me. God pulled me out of that. When he came out of prison, he just lives, he works out at this Planet Fitness right over. He lives right here in the area. And he said, when I got out of prison, my wife said, you choose your God or you choose me and your daughter. If you stay with Jesus, we leave. They left him. And he said, I cannot turn my back on Jesus, no matter the cost. Now, he may not have laid, he may be not physically dead. There's a man that said, I will, I'm laying down my life. What is more dear to him than his wife and his child? Not much. These are people that walk the earth today. That they're in our communities. It might be here in this building that say, I don't care what would happen. I told you some months ago about the story in uh, Soviet Russia where the underground churches were there and they had the churches and the soldiers came up and they had guns on the pastor and they had a picture of Jesus Christ, the face of Jesus, of what they had a picture of him and they said, spit on him or we'll kill you. And the pastor came out and spit on it. One by one, the deacons came out, spit on this picture or we'll kill you. They spit on it. About the fifth or sixth person that came out it was a girl that had long black hair. She started crying, washed that face with the, the spit, said, I'll never deny my Jesus. They shot her. We know that story because one of the soldiers that shot her said, that so affected me. He became a believer and shared the story. That's how we know the story. He said, I saw someone that said, I will not bend to Caesar. I will not bend to the spirit of this world. I know my Redeemer lives. We hear, we hear these stories. These are in our time. These aren't, we read, someone so often we read these over the last 2,000 years ago. Folks, it's the same Jesus alive today. And if you say, well, I got kids or I got grandkids or I got this or I got that, and there's no hope. That's a lie from the devil. We, it is written, we have a living hope in Jesus Christ. We not only have hope, we have a living hope. I love that story. I know we're not in Revelation. I love the story when Martha and Mary, and they said, Jesus, had you only been here back here? Had you been here on my schedule? Lord, forgive us. <laughs> Lord, had you obeyed me and gotten here when I told you to get here, my brother would be alive. We know you could heal him. And Jesus says, do you believe in the resurrection? Of course I believe in the resurrection. And Jesus says, I and the resurrection. It, We're looking for an event. He says, you're not looking for an event. You're looking for a person. Thank yeah, don't be looking for events. I'd only be happy if. I'm happy because Jesus died on the cross for my sins. Yeah. I want the joy of my salvation. Yeah. And the devil will try to take the joy of your salvation. He can't take your salvation. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> he can take the joy. And he's a liar and he's a thief. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Devil, no. The answer is no. Jesus gave me joy. Jesus gave me peace. Not as the world gives, but as he gives it, you can't have it. So we see a lamb that broke the fifth seal. And under the altar was the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God. These are brothers and sisters that died, not in car wrecks or other tragedies or illnesses, these are people that said, I will not yield even though my life be forfeit. And it says these people are under the altar. I did some study on this. You know, Hebrews tells us that the temple in the Old Testament and the tabernacle was the image of a heavenly uh, place. And, and there was two altars in the temple. There was one altar that was out here, the, br the bronze altar, where they would put the fire and burn the animals and kill the animals on it. And then they had an altar that was right before you go into the Holy of Holies. There was a golden altar made of acacia wood, and it was covered in gold. And it was a smaller altar, about two feet tall, had four horns, as that one did. And they would take fire from the bronze altar, always it was burning, offering up sacrifice. And they brought it over here to the golden altar. And this altar, incense would go up and was a sweet smell to Jesus, to the Lord. And, and that's where you might remember the sons of Korah. They took strange fire. They took fire that didn't come from there. And they went in their own method and said, well, we're going to put fire in, not that came from the bronze altar. We're going to do our own fire. We're going to worship God our way. Woo you come like he said or you don't come. Here's what Jesus said. I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but through me. 
you don't go through Jesus, you don't go. But what if I have this really? What if, what if I believe in myself? Lord, forgive you. What, what, if I, what if I'm sincere in my closely held fake religious beliefs? Doesn't work. What, what, what if the ship's going down? I want to grab this anchor because I really think I've got faith this anchor floats. And I want to grab this anchor and hold on to it. You're going to sink to the bottom of the ocean. But what if I really believe it? It doesn't matter. <laughs> Jesus, it is written. No one comes to the Father but through Jesus. Doesn't matter. I love you. I, I love everybody. I love you enough to tell you the truth. So the Lamb opens the fifth seal, and the Lamb sees these men and women that have been slain. I thought how tragic it was. Uh, the letter from uh, the lady in England where they were adults and they became followers of Christ and they told the, the church that was there at the time, we can't follow those beliefs anymore. We, we, have, we have the biblical theology and they got baptized as adults and they said, if you get baptized, we're going to kill you. You've already been baptized. You can't get adult. You can't come to Christ by yourself. You can have the church tell you that you're saved. Baloney. No, no church membership saves you. Yeah. Being in the family of God, accepting that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, was buried and rose again, that's what saves you. You can be Methodist, Lutheran, Catholic. It doesn't matter if you believe Jesus died for my sins, was buried and rose again, and you yield to his lordship. You're a believer. Amen. That's it. Praise the Lord. And you know there's going to be Lutherans and Methodists and Catholics and Presbyterians in heaven, and there's going to be some Baptists in hell. It has nothing to do with what your denomination says. It has everything to do with what the Bible says. So here's some people that said, we will not yield our testimony. That mom, she ended up getting, the husband and wife were baptized. She was pregnant with her, a child, and the church killed the husband and said it's not the child's fault. So once the mom bears, has the baby, we'll take the baby, but then we'll kill the mom after the baby's born. And we know this story because she wrote a letter to her unborn child and said, do not hate these people for killing your father and me. Jesus loves them. We love them. They're misguided. Forgive them. And we have that letter of a mom to her unborn child saying, forgive the people that killed your parents. That's the love of Christ. That's not, that's not human. That's not the kind of love that comes from humanity. That's the kind of love that only comes from the mind and the heart of God. So here's these people that have experienced this kind of love and this kind of grace and this kind of mercy. And when it came to them and they were tested up to the point of their life, they said, we will not, we will not deny. We will die before we deny. But I love what Paul says in Philippians, for me to die is gain, you know, for, for me to live is Christ. But when I die, I get my rewards. I don't know, I don't know who d does those marathons. I have no idea why people do those marathons. It's baffled me from day one. I got that 0, 0.0 sticker on my car. <laughs> but those people that run those marathons, they start out full of vim and vigor, and they probably deteriorate. They get to that finish line, and they're happy again, and they're joyful, and they're raising their hands up, and they're cheering. Folks, I can't, that's a perfect description of heaven. We're in the middle. We're probably mile, I hope we're mile 25.3 or something. I don't know where, where, wherever that is, but, but we're in the middle. We're in the race. We're in the struggle right now. But folks, the finish line's coming. Yes. Hold up your hands. Cheer. Praise. We've got such a cloud of witnesses. Come on, man. You know, we go through all in Hebrews 11, the great story of faith. And by faith, mountains were moved. Yes. By faith, people were raised from the dead. Yes. By faith, lions' mouths were closed. By faith, fire didn't burn people. Oh, by faith, the waters opened up and they walked through on dry land. On, by, faith. by faith. And we praise that and we hear it and we love it. But Hebrews 11, I think verse 35, the second part says, but some were torn asunder. Some were given to the lions. Some were cut in half. Some were burned. Some were killed. Some were murdered. It's all one family. So those that the lion's mouths were closed, some people God didn't close. He's got a plan. He's got a plan for that. this one. He's got a plan for that one. And sometimes it's not always what we want. But this is where we say, God... I will lay down my life, maybe not physically die, my goals, my dreams, my visions of what I want. Father, give me grace and understanding and discernment to see what you want yeah. for me. Let my heart break for what breaks yours. 
Here's what Jesus said. Jesus, you could ask him today, Jesus, why'd you go to earth? I came to seek and to save that which was lost. Yes, That's what I came for. I cannot tell you how grateful I am that Jesus came to this earth. Some of you know that my grandfather was an alcoholic up in Chicago, South Side, where I was born. You know the history of my, some of you might know the history, some of you might know the stuff in it. I know where we come from, I know where I am. Praise Jesus. <laughs> it is 100%. He carried us on his back. And as you heard me say that old thing about the footprints in the sand, Jesus, when I was in my toughest spots, I only saw one footprint. That's when I carried you. What's that big long line? That's where I dragged you. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes Jesus says, you're coming this way whether you want to or not. But I don't want to. Keep talking. <laughs> you keep talking. I'll keep dragging. So some of these folks laid down their lives for their testimony, which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? We do have to talk about this. We may not get to, we may not get to the sixth seal today. At first, when you read this, you might say, That doesn't sound very Christian, does it? How long, Lord, before you go punish those people for doing what you did to us? we got to be careful, and you can look on your little uh, magic boxes there. Not now. Later. But the word between avenge and revenge. And they're different. Revenge said, you caused me some kind of harm, and based on that, I want to cause you some kind of harm. Yeah. Avenge says there's something called justice. And I want God's justice to be carried out. Not because of... And we see this in our own society where the courts have to be very judicial and make sure we don't get into, we're going to punish you maliciously because you did this act. It's here's the law and the law has to be satisfied. And when God said back in Genesis, the day you disobey my words, the day you will die, that law is still in existence. I talked to some men this week. We were going through the book of Genesis and I shared with them, I said, you know, they said, well, you know, the day they ate that, they still lived. And as many of you know, from our studies that we've done in Genesis, it said they made fig leaves and their way to cover their sin, God said, that's not going to work. So he made them uh, clothes from animal skins. And they said, yeah, well, they didn't die. I said, where do you think God got those animal skins? Where do you think those animal skins came from? Where do you think that leather came from? Somebody died. When our sin, and God said, when you sin, you will die, that law must be satisfied. It was satisfied in the God-man, Jesus Christ, in the mediator. There's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. He perfectly represents humanity to God. He perfectly represents God to humanity. Jesus, show us the Father. How long have I been with you? Jesus told you, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you've walked... Some of you young people, I envy you, your youth. I, I think I pulled someone. I did that move here a little bit ago. <laughs> but, you know, at the tender age of 58, I say, you know, I've walked with Jesus for about 25, 20, 30 years now. And it is sweeter every day. It gets sweeter and sweeter. And you young folks, I want to encourage you as you're growing up and aging and getting older and going through the struggles of life, cling to the cross. It'll get you through. His word is true. His word is faithful. So they say, how long, O Lord? They're not really saying revenge us. They're saying, how long, Lord, before you bring what's justice to this world? We're looking for God's justice. We're not really looking for revenge for us. Someone curses you or says something. Me and a guy named Mike, some years ago, we were out witnessing. We stopped at a gas station and we're getting gas. Someone said, what are you guys doing? And we walked up with a Bible. We're, well, blankety blank, and I don't want anything to do, and blah, blah, blah. I got back in the car, and Mike said, what's wrong? He said, man, we just got a blessing. What are you talking about? Blessed are you when you're reviled for my name's sake. Yes. We just got a little reward from that guy. Pe not pe from him, but because of him. Because yes. it is written. I said, Good. he said, well, I was going to say, let's just be done for the day. That was a real bucket of water on our fire. I said, no, that was gasoline on our fire. <laughs> we know the devil's mad. Yeah. He sent one of his. To wear us out. Mm -mm. I, it is written, blessed are you when you're reviled for my name's sake. If we'd have talked about basketball or football or sports or the weather, that guy probably would have just said not a word. The moment we brought up Jesus, his countenance changed. Mm, 
revile for his name's sake. So how long, they're looking for how long, O oh Lord, before you who are holy and true, how long will you retrain, refrain from judging and avenging our blood, making it right? Who, who just would like, I told, we, Kelly and I were talking way down here, I said, everything in life's a struggle. Yeah. Everything. We, we were by the, the, does anyone remember the old blimp base up in spring? We were there the, driving by there and, you know, Kelly is like, Boy, I, I remember the old blue. I like it so much better when it was all farmland here and cows and easy life and everything was smooth. I said, man, me too. It was so much easier back then. Now everything's, pay your, pay your water bill online. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. So they're saying, God, we just want everything to be right and just again. We want everything to be like it was back in the garden. That's really what our call for humanity is. How long will you refrain from fixing the problems? It says, there was given to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed, even as they had been, meaning they are going to be killed because of their testimony in the word of God. They're going to be killed for the same reason. When that number is fulfilled, when that number is complete, then I think seal six happens. Because they're saying, we want truth and justice to rule on the world. And if, if and, and I've been working on this, if they're on the altar, if they're under the altar of the brazen, where the, where the sacrifice was, you could argue, because they're under the altar, they were a sacrifice unto God. But also their death, I could also very much believe, is on the altar of incense, where they're, they're what God told Abel, you know, Cain, he said, your, blood, your brother's blood cries to me from the ground. I hear it, and that was the prayers that would go up. So I'm really still struggling with, the altar, I'm still working through the Hebrews where it says that the temple was a facsimile of the temple that's in heaven, not built with human hands. It, were they on the, this altar of sacrifice? But part of my, my theology says, no, because the sacrifice was paid. Yeah. So it puts me back over here on the altar of incense, which is they're praying to the God for justice. That's the prayers of the saints going up to God. If I come to, if I ever, if someone has any knowledge on that, call me or text me or whatever, but I'm still working through it. But either way, they were under an altar. And God says, just take it easy. I've got everything under control. Here's your white robe. Here's, here's my pledge to you until which time you get your glorified body. Here's a white robe. We know in James 1.12, uh, that it says that they're going to have a crown of life. If you give your life for your testimony, the word of the Lord, it says God gives you a crown of life. They're still waiting on their crowns. That's a good, isn't that a good deal? Yeah. Let's say you win the, 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 that marathon race and they say tomorrow morning as you get the gold medal and all the awards and the, you know, you're excited. You're just sitting there excited, waiting. He's just sit down. I got under control. Just rest. Take it easy. Yeah. I'm going to make it right. I'll tell you this also. This is more now kind of a, teaching thing, when someone does you wrong, it takes faith not to be mad at them, not to want to get even, not to want to get back. Because what you're saying when someone does you wrong, and you say, Jesus says that one day he's going to fix that. Do I have faith that vengeance is his? Do I have faith to put this what's been done me wrong in his hand and said, God, you take care of it. I actually, when I get older, if someone does me wrong, I say, Lord, forgive them. I don't want justice on them. I want forgiveness. I want your justice to eventually come to this world, but I don't want your justice to land on them because I know for a fact I don't want your justice to land on me. I want your mercy. Now that I have his mercy, I don't have to worry about punishment. I still have a thought back here about his discipline. He'll still discipline his children, but he's not going to punish us in wrath. He will discipline us in love, and those are two radically different concepts. The world may not be able to discern that. Well, if you spank your child, you're, you're bad, you're evil. No, I love my child. I'm not spanking them out of anger or hostility or meanness to them. I'm spanking them out of discipline, out of love. Whom a father loves, he disciplines. Yeah. That's love. That's not anger. You smack them, you hit them, you, hit, you know, that's different. That's a completely different situation. But then we see when they cry out that we want justice, we want your justice to be done. Verse 12 opens up and says, I looked and he broke the sixth seal and there was a great earthquake. That earthquake's added. It can definitely be worked. Earthquake, it's the word seismos, 
when we get our word seismic activity or seismograph, it's the Greek word seismos. There was a shaking is also a very proper word there. It wasn't just an earthquaking. It was a universe shaking. And we'll see that in a moment. It says there was a great shaking and the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair and the whole moon became like blood. So there's two groups of people talking here. One that laid down their lives for the Lord. One that they also have a testimony. This, this second group has a testimony. and We'll get to it in a minute. It says the stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree cast its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. If you're out in the country, you see maybe in the fall, if we don't have fig trees here, but you might see where the leaves, a wind comes by and you see the leaves fall down. It says just be a shaking of that tree and that's what's not as built on the solid rock is going to get shaken. It's going to fall. It says not only the stars, we know that if a star crashed to earth, it'd probably wipe us out like that, the size of stars. But it's, it's heavenly objects as they, they're going to start falling to earth, comets, meteors, they're going to start falling to earth. It's just to be shaking as though where they come from and where they land, we don't know. They're just going to be there. Do we have to worry about this? We don't have to worry. And so it would be a great shaking. The sky was split apart like a scroll when it's rolled up. And every mountain and every island were moved out of their places. So the day's going to come when the sky does open up. And I don't know if we're going to see into the heavens, the throne room. But this sky that we call sky or atmosphere is going to open up. And things are going to change drastically. The world's going to get shook. I wrote here in my notes back in... Uh, uh, June 5th, Tonga, which is over by Vanuatu in the South Pacific, had a volcanic blast. It said the energy of that blast went around the world two times. Wow. From one, one volcanic blast, it said the energy could be picked up. 22 hours later, it got picked up again. Went around the world. It uh, added 10% of water vapor to the Earth's atmosphere which said it will probably eat up the ozone. I don't know about all that science stuff, but I think ozone's good. Losing is bad. I don't know. I'm not a scientist. That's what I hear. It'll, it said the Tonga blast will affect global temperatures. It'll change the temperature, probably make us warmer. They said when dust goes up, dust reflects the sun and heat back out. Water holds it. Hot, it it'll make it the Earth's temperature higher. This was January 5th of this year. It said expect the world's temperature to go up because of this blast. One blast. Uh, it said it'll be noticed our temperatures will go up from several years to a few decades. Leading scientists said that one blast will affect Earth's temperature for possibly the next two to 20 years. One blast. What happens when we start having meteorites fly in and volcanoes blow up and earthquakes all over the world? There was an earthquake in uh, Japan. You might have remembered back in April of 2011. The J Japanese earthquake, it moved the entire island of Japan eight feet that entire landmass, they said, looking from this uh, out in space, looking down, the entire landmass moved eight feet. 250 miles of shoreline was gone from Japan. And it changed Earth's access, access by seven and a half feet. There's no longer its proper access. They said it, that earthquake in Japan changed the rotation of the Earth. Our years are like one tenth of a second less now than they were because it changed time, one earthquake. We don't normally think about this scientific stuff like this, but when it says there will be a shaking of the universe, what's that going to do to life on earth? And it says when these, these scroll, the skies rolls back, and this is what, not, this is what makes me so concerned and break, it should break our hearts like the Christ of heart, uh, the, the heart of Christ it says, they, the people, verse 15, the kings of the earth, so the leaders, political rulers of the world, great men, ambassadors, statesmen, whoever great men and women of the earth are, the commanders, the rich, the strong, the slave, the free, all stratus of society, from the highest to the lowest, said all of them hid themselves among the caves and among the rocks. And this is what got me thinking, this... Souls of the saints are under the altar. We're the souls and lives of those that aren't saved. They're in the mountains. I would rather be under the altar in heaven than in a mountain asking the mountain to fall in on me and kill me. That's what they're, they're, they're two very different people here and they go through some very similar things. But it said here they're going to be in the mountains. Uh, verse 16, they said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne. 
This is what alarmed me. They now know what we know. They're not saying, pray to the rocks to fall on us because there was an earthquake. Pray to the rocks to fall on us and kill us because there's meteors landing. They say, pray and kill us and hide us from the land that sits on the throne. We know who he is now. One day their eyes are going to be opened and they're going to know who's causing this. And instead of coming to the, to the Lord in repentance, they hid from him. And before we get too upset about their, they shouldn't have done that, and what did Adam and Eve do in the garden? Adam, where are you? Eve, where are you? I created you perfectly. I gave you a perfect world. We don't live in a perfect world. He gave them a perfect world. Everything was good. And there's a whole big nugget of truth in there. When God gave them the trees, were the trees good to eat? Were the trees a blessing? And if you read that, it could have very easily, Genesis could have said, and Adam and Eve hid themselves from God. But here's what it says. Adam and Eve hid themselves behind the trees from God. Do we ever let our blessings get in between us and the Lord? I got a big pile of money. I go get a car. I got a big boat. God, Sunday's busy now. I'm out on the lake on my big boat you gave me. I got a new job. I will work late Saturday. I can't go to church now. I got this new job. I prayed for a job. You gave me this blessing. and Now I don't have time for you, God. That's a whole other nugget of truth in Genesis there. We can take God's blessings and hide behind them. Because that Genesis could have very easily said, and Adam and Eve hid themselves from the Lord. But it, does, it says he, they hid themselves behind the trees from the Lord. So when we read this here with these people, and it says they hid in the mountains and hid in the caves and they cried for the rocks to fall down and crush them to hide them from the presence of him. This isn't new. This started in the garden. To hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. I am so glad God's wrath doesn't abide on me. We love that John 3.16. I also love that John 3.36. He that hath the son hath life. But he that does not have the Son, the wrath of God remains on him. This is that wrath. And this is only seal seven. We've got bowl judgments. We've got trumpet judgments. We've got a whole lot more coming at us. Not at us, at the world. For the great day of their wrath has come. Who will be able to stand? We know in Matthew... When Jesus is talking about this in Matthew 24, it says, except that God had closed those days short, no life would exist. To all those people out there that green peacers and tree huggers, I do think we should, God gave us a responsibility over the earth. We absolutely should protect our environment. But when I see this save the world, they ain't gonna, we ain't going to do that. This world's disposable in God's economy. That's right. I don't want this. This world's broken. I don't, want a broke, I don't want to live eternity in a broken world. I want a new heaven. I want a new Jerusalem. I want a new one. Praise God. And he's built, busy doing that. And I'll close with this. I'm a, I'm a seven-day, 24-hour creation person. If you're not, that's fine. You're wrong. But that's fine. You can have that thought. In my humble but accurate opinion, it's seven days, 24 hours. Because there was an evening and a morning. That's the kind of day God's talking about. He says this kind of day had an evening and a morning. It's the kind of day he's talking about. But if he built all this in seven days, how long has he been gone since the cross, since the tomb? 2,000 years, give or take. John 14, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If we're not told, I would have told you that. I'm going to prepare a place for you. He's been up there 2,000 years working on building us a place. He did all of this in seven days. What in the world do you think waits for us? Eye has not seen, nor has ear heard, nor has the mind of man fathomed the blessings God has for his people. It is stunning to me. I can't wait. If you're at home, if you're not a believer, right now, say the words, Jesus, forgive me, a sinner. If you're here with us, if you're here at some future time, I want to go to heaven. I want Jesus to be my brother. I want Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. I believe you died. I believe you were, uh, were buried. I believe you rose again. Don't forget me when you come back. Pass me not, O oh gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. While in others are passing, do not pass me by. Pray with me. Father, praise your holy name. Hallelujah. 
Praise the name of the Lord. We thank you for salvation. We thank you for free grace, free mercy. Help us to be conduits of your love and your mercy and your grace into this community. You planted Autumn Creek at 6435 Barker Cypress for a reason. Father, let us bloom. Let us bear fruit to this community. Let us reach out to the lost and the hurting and bring them into your family. Father, forgive us where we fail you. Forgive us where we're focused on our plans and our ideas and not yours. Father, to him that knows to do good and does it not, it is sin. Forgive us for our sins of omission. That's what we know we should do and we don't. Father, we ask your blood and your grace and your mercy to flow over this community, flow over this nation, flow over the people in, this, in, in a stone's throw from this building that right now maybe their marriages are falling apart, their kids are leaving, there's arguments, they're screaming, there's arguing and fighting. Father, bring your peace into that home. Let the Prince of Peace invade those lives and bring them to the throne of grace. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.